Tonight, taking on tech giants, Ontario school boards sue social media companies for billions. Accusations of addictive platforms. With their friends are on screens, they're going to be on screens. But the province calls the move a distraction. Let's focus on the kids, not about this other nonsense. Childcare politics, another budget commitment aimed at younger voters. I want to take a moment to talk to young moms. Plus, arrival, but no departure. The flight attendants using their job to declare asylum. We have about eight people that have gone missing in Canada. There's a very simple solution to this problem. Also, rising measles cases. The warning from public health ahead of family gatherings on Easter weekend. And the $64 million question. We're just so over the moon excited that it's concluded in this way. Why a lottery winner in New Brunswick waited almost a year to claim a massive prize. <laughs> CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with what is likely a first-of-its-kind lawsuit in Canada, setting up a historic legal battle between Canadian school boards and social media giants. The four boards, including Canada's largest, the Toronto District School Board, collectively represent more than 365,000 students and say Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat and TikTok have been designed for compulsive use and that schools are unfairly bearing the brunt of the learning and mental health epidemic caused by the alleged negligent conduct of social media companies. So the boards are suing the platform's owners for about $4.5 billion in damages. CTV's Kamil Karamali on the accusations and the reaction. Kamil. Omar, educators say they're losing the battle against social media in the classroom, so they're choosing to take the fight to court. Hours of scrolling. I think everybody's addicted to these social media and devices. And staring at screens. With their friends are on screens, they're going to be on screens. Allegations social media companies are having an increasing impact in classrooms. Rather than changing the algorithms so that they're less addictive, They've instead focused on profitability, engagement, serving up more ads. Now school boards in Ontario hoping to hit social media giants where it hurts. Their bank accounts. The Toronto Peel, Ottawa Carleton and Toronto Catholic school boards filing four separate cases in the Ontario Superior Court of Justice today, suing Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, as well as Snapchat and TikTok for $4.5 billion. We're seeing emotional dysregulation. We're seeing a lack of ability to focus. We're seeing a lot of anxiety and emotional health and well-being challenges. Claiming they've had to literally pay the price for students' social media addiction, incurring costs for curriculum changes, digital literacy courses, mental health supports, investigating threats, and even property damage from social media challenges. Our school boards are, this is a necessary piece in order to allow them to make sure that they can teach and our ch children can focus. Ontario's Premier calling it nonsense. I disagree with them. They, let's focus on the core values of education. Let's focus on uh, math and reading and writing. Earlier this month, British Columbia introduced legislation allowing it to go after social media companies. You will be held accountable in British Columbia for the harm that you caused following in the footsteps of a growing number of lawsuits popping up in the U.S., more than 40 states and hundreds of school districts have now launched legal action against social media companies. In response, TikTok says it has many safeguards in place, including parental controls. Most of the social media companies have not responded publicly. Snapchat, though, has said its app is for close friends, specifically saying it's different from the other social media platforms. Omar. All right, Kamil, thank you. I want to bring in University of Waterloo Associate Professor Amy Morrison now, who is an expert in social media and studies how it connects to issues of personal identity. Professor, thank you for joining us. How significant is this case? This is the first major lawsuit in Canada launched on behalf of the public against a private social media company seeking damages related to public harms. These lawsuits have become more common over the past year in the United States, but this is the first one in Canada. 
Now, the school boards allege that the companies, quote, knew or ought to have known that the deliberate design of their products would interfere with students' access to education. In your research, have you found evidence of this? Yeah, I think the evidence is pretty clear that what these social media sites take from students is their attention. That's by design, right? So the stretch here is making the case that by taking students' attention in such a thorough and effective way, this is what is reducing their access to education. All right, Professor Amy Morrison tonight, thank you. For the second day in a row, the Prime Minister unveiled another key part of next month's federal budget. And it has to do with access to cheaper child care. While costs are down, wait lists are up. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver on the new pledge to refine an old promise and why the government isn't waiting until budget day to make it. Nearly two years ago, Saba Aloda jumped at the chance to join Ottawa's $10 a day child care program. But the initiative she was excited to offer parents has become a source of constant stress. The money is not paying off all the expenses, so we are running out of cash all the time. The Liberal government launched the $30 billion federal daycare program in 2021, promising at least 250,000 new spaces by 2026 at an average cost of $10 a day. But while the government says fees across the country have come down at least 50 percent, demand and wait lists have grown. We stand strongly in favour of childcare and while we are working so closely with the provinces that are excited about building this, but also holding to account uh, the provinces that are not moving as fast or as responsibly as they should. To help the program run better, Ottawa is making $1 billion in low-cost loans and $60 million in non-repayable grants available to public and not-for-profit child care centres. It's also offering $48 million worth of student loan forgiveness for rural and remote early childhood educators and investing $10 million over two years to train more early childhood educators. Does this announcement go far enough to meet all of the needs of the workforce? No. But is it a really important step to acknowledge the important work that they're doing? Absolutely. For Al Oda, a for-profit daycare whose prices are frozen despite rising costs of food, labor and rent, today's announcement doesn't offer any assistance. They need to look at the inflation and give us like some um, a window to breathe, you know. Without that window, some daycares fear for the future. And economists say the more spaces that are open, the better. In order to deliver the big benefits of the program, which is higher female labor force participation, higher revenues in tax revenues because people are working, higher economic growth because people are working. Uh, these only come if there's spaces for people to put kids and then go to work. Expect more of these affordability announcements geared towards younger voters over the coming weeks. It's all part of a new strategy, Omar, to get more attention ahead of Budget Day. All right, Annie, thank you. Let's bring in CTV News pollster and chair of Nanos Research, Nick Nanos, now for some analysis. Nick, yesterday it was an announcement targeted at renters. Today it was childcare. Save for occasional leaks, these kinds of public pre-budget announcements from the government are very rare. What does the shift say about the Liberals? Well, right now the Liberals are, are dealing with the Conservatives who are a political freight train. They're probably trying to build the winning coalition from 2015 that included women and also young people. So they're going to be rolling out these, these initiatives in order to re-engage people that were in the red column but now are not. You mentioned young voters, a key demographic that helped catapult the Liberals to victory in 2015. How much ground do they need to gain in order to get to where they were? They had about a 30-point advantage over the Conservatives and the New Democrats among voters that were under 30 years of age. That 30-point advantage, Omar, has changed into trailing the Conservatives of all parties by 20 points. So there's been a seismic shift in younger voters who right now are turning away from the Liberals and looking at the Conservatives. All right, Nick, thank you for this tonight. In a New York courtroom today, a spectacular downfall for the man once known as the Crypto King. Sam Bankman-Fried was sentenced to 25 years in prison for one of the biggest frauds in U.S. history. While his cryptocurrency company went bankrupt, he stole billions from customers to cover his expenses. Luxury homes, private planes, political donations, just to name a few. The judge saying there was never a word of remorse for the commission of terrible crimes. Frightening moments in Montreal today involving not just one but two drive-by shootings and a crash that killed two suspects, 
all within the span of 15 minutes. Police are trying to piece together what exactly happened and how this fits into the escalating tensions in the city. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin reports. At 5 a.m., a call went out to 911, a drive-by shooting in Montreal. A man on his way to work struck by a bullet. Uh, a man age of 41 that was driving the vehicle at the moment or the gunshots were fired, so he was struck to his upper body. That man was rushed to the hospital. We don't fear for his life. Moments later, a second call. Another drive-by shooting just about six kilometers away. A second crime scene. We had a driver, a man age of 58, that was driving the vehicle at the moment, was not struck, was not injured. It seems police located the suspect's vehicle and that there may have been a police chase down this residential road, where the speed limit is 30 kilometers an hour. C'était comme une fusée ou un décollage d'avion. It sounded like a rocket or a plane taking off right here on our street, she says. That's how fast that car was going. A neighbor captured these images. The suspect's vehicle crashed against a tree. Those on board, two men in their 20s, were killed. Police are now trying to determine the motive for the drive-by shootings, random acts of violence or gang-related shootings. There has been an escalation of tensions on the streets of Montreal, and that's something that police officers are really trying to crack down on. Officers have conducted a series of raids and arrests, part of what investigators say is an attempt to curtail violence linked to a turf war over the control of the drug trade trying to avoid any repeat of the bloody biker war of the 1990s in Quebec that left more than 165 dead, including innocent bystanders like an 11-year-old boy. But for now, police say they have a lot more to uncover before they know exactly why this wave of early morning violence unfolded. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. A Quebec judge has ordered a bus driver to stand trial for the deaths of two children last year at a Montreal-area daycare. The four- and five-year-olds were killed when a transit bus slammed into the front of the building. Six others were injured. The driver faces charges including first-degree murder. An eight-year-old girl is the sole survivor of a bus crash that killed 45 people in South Africa. Local authorities say the driver lost control on a bridge, crashing through a concrete barrier. The bus then plunging 50 meters into a ravine, bursting into flames. The passengers were all pilgrims traveling from Botswana to an Easter service. A thousand-ton crane will be part of the massive cleanup operation to pull pieces of the Baltimore bridge that collapsed after a cargo vessel rammed into it. The dolly is almost as long as the Eiffel Tower. And the dolly has the key bridge on top of it. We're talking three to 4,000 tons of steel. Investigators today released this new video from inside the vessel. Data from the black box reveals crew members called for tugboats and the captain tried dropping anchor in a frantic but ultimately hopeless attempt to avert disaster. Let us join together in a moment of silence for those who lost their lives. Also today, the Baltimore Orioles held a moment of silence for the six victims who were killed and the three first responders who stopped traffic on the bridge, saving lives. Several flight attendants from Pakistan have gone missing after landing here in Canada. They've abandoned their posts and are believed to be seeking asylum. It's a common problem that appears to be taking off. CTV's Heather Wright is tracking the story. Several times a week, a Pakistan International Airlines flight touches down in Toronto, with crew members staying in nearby hotels before boarding the flight back home. It's a flight an increasing number of crew members aren't getting on. So far, unfortunately, since last year, we have uh, about eight people that have gone missing uh, in Canada. PIA says the flight attendants have all abandoned their jobs to seek asylum in Canada, the most recent case in February. When a woman didn't show up for the shuttle back to the airport, her colleagues got worried and went to her hotel room. She uh, left her uniform there with a note saying thank you, PIA. The Canada Border Services Agency won't comment on these cases or why the flight attendants sought asylum, citing privacy. Adding airline crew members are exempt from obtaining visas to travel here, and asylum seekers can make a claim at any port of entry into the country. The PIA says Canada makes it easy for their workers to defect. Immigration lawyers say that's the point. It's not a criticism of Canada, I hope, but it, it reinforces what is widely known around the world for those that can get here. 
and make a refugee claim. PIA has been accused of downplaying these defections, but inside Pakistan it has created embarrassment and logistical challenges for the airline in a country struggling with economic and political instability. PIA says it is now profiling crew members it assigns to Canadian flights, only choosing those they believe will come back. We're sending crew members who have established linkages in Pakistan, such as people who are married, who have served the organization for more than 15, 20 years. Flight attendants with PIA have been complaining about low wages for years, and in the face of spiraling debt, the airline is in the process of being taken private. But challenges within the broader economy persist, with inflation in Pakistan hovering near 30 percent. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. Coming up, an urgent warning. And I think a lot of people don't really see measles as a serious public health threat. The risks of outbreaks over Easter, plus collateral damage in an epic battle between natural enemies. As many people plan family gatherings and celebrations for Easter weekend, health officials are warning about a potential unwanted guest. Cases of measles are on the rise right across the country. CTV Scott Hurst has more on the growing concern over vaccination. Scott. Omar, there is a high likelihood infectious travelers will continue to show up in Canada. And because of that, a very good chance we could see multiple outbreaks in school settings and some health care facilities within the next six weeks. That's according to a recent risk assessment by the Public Health Agency of Canada. We have seen confirmed cases found in four provinces so far, 28 in Quebec, 10 in Ontario, and one each in Saskatchewan and British Columbia. Canada is currently experiencing an increase in measles activity. 40 cases may seem relatively minor, but it is already three times the number of cases reported in all of 2023, and we're just a quarter of the way through this year. The majority of measles cases in Canada are in people who are unvaccinated. Some people with recent infections were exposed while traveling internationally, while others exposed here in Canada. Measles is highly contagious and can circulate rapidly with people who are unvaccinated. There's a very simple solution to this problem, which is get people vaccinated. And I think a lot of people have fallen victim to some degree of complacency for a lot of reasons. And I think a lot of people don't really see measles as a serious public health threat. And if we maintain high vaccination rates, it won't be. In 2021, more than 90% of two-year-olds had at least one dose of a measles vaccine. But according to the same national data, less than 80% of seven-year-olds had the second dose. It's because of that and the rising case count, the country's top doctor is urging families to ensure their vaccinations are up to date. Omar. All right, Scott, thanks. Still ahead. It is a small but boisterous crowd here in St. Petersburg. Hope springs eternal for the Toronto Blue Jays and their fans. Well, spring has arrived and the boys of summer are back. The Toronto Blue Jays played the season opener in Florida today. CTV's Beth McDonnell caught up with fans watching the game at home. Eyes are peeled to TV sets as the Toronto Blue Jays play their season opener in Tampa Bay against the Rays. I attend every game. I've always been a Blue Jays fan ever since I was a little kid, dating back to Exhibition Stadium. And it's just something that's a part of me. Uh, we always do opening day. We've got a crew here, we've got our kids here. Uh, it's a great time. We love baseball. We love the Jays. The Jays begin their return with a 10-game road trip, which includes stops in New York to play against the Yankees and in Houston to play against the Astros. Both opponents could make Toronto start a tough one. It's all against teams that either made the playoffs or missed by like one game. And so for the Blue Jays, we're going to find out early on can they be better than who they were last year? The team made few changes in the offseason. Some of the Blue Jays' biggest fans are using a little reverse psychology to set up the season. I'm expecting this team to do the opposite of the last two years. Last two years they were favorites, didn't do well. 
this year they're kind of underdogs and I think they're going to do well. The road trip will also allow for renovations to continue at Rogers Centre, so the stadium will be ready for the home opener. I saw the renos last year, I thought it was amazing, and I'm looking forward to uh, the other things they're doing inside. Torontonians are feeling optimistic. <laughs> I hope they win the World Series, because I know I've been to the game and they haven't been good, but I love them anyways, and I hope they win. I'm really rooting for them this year. Actually, I'm very excited, of course, and they're probably going to win. Yeah, I hope so. With hope for a winning season, hi. Beth McDonnell, CTV News, Toronto. A woman in Florida was shocked to find that her car was vandalized by a couple of neighborhood pets. Two dogs tore apart the front of her vehicle, damaging it badly while the owners slept. Unbelieved it was dogs until after they saw the video. Christine Barr called the sheriff who discovered the surveillance footage of the dogs and also found the reason for the attack, a cat that had jumped under the engine. The cat got away, but the car had about $3,000 in damage. A lot of money, but not for the winner in this next story. After the break, the $64 million win claimed was just days to go until the ticket's expiry date. A New Brunswick man has now claimed Atlantic Canada's largest lotto just 19 days before it was due to expire. CTV Sarah Plowman on why it took nearly a year to find the new multimillionaire. The winner hit the jackpot 11 months ago, big time. $64 million. Just imagine what one could buy. But who won? No one knew. As of yet, no one has come forward to claim it. Atlantic Canada's biggest lottery prize ever. The deadline to claim it just weeks away. $64 million. Run. Atlantic Lottery sent a town crier to the county where the ticket was bought. That same day, by coincidence, Mirel Chesson checked his stack of lottery tickets before they expire. Congratulations. He was the mystery winner. At a check presentation, he was asked where the ticket was for 11 months. <laughs> At my house, he says. For 347 days, the $64 million ticket sat on his bedroom dresser. <laughs> it's his routine, she says, to check his tickets right before they expire. And that's what he did this week at the store. <laughs> it's a dream, the store owner says. She gets 1% and a relief to Atlantic Lottery. And we're just so over the moon excited that it's concluded in this way and that we're able to pay out this prize. Chaisson is a crab fisherman who works at a fish plant in northern New Brunswick. He plans to retire. As for the money, I don't know, he says. Chaisson plans to keep buying lottery tickets. In fact, the day he learned he won, he bought another ticket before leaving the store. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Moncton. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather is here tomorrow and next week while I'm away. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. And to everyone celebrating, happy Easter. Good night. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.